nine foods based on scientific literature that you should consume over the age of 50. Jumping right in. Number one, MCT oil. Okay, with a lot of these things that I'm going to talk about, if we're looking at longevity, we're looking at even cognitive function, we do have to be okay with looking at some rodent model research. This might turn you off because it's not human data, but some of this is human data, some of it's rodent. When we look at large scale stuff and we project into the future, we have to be okay with investigating rodent model stuff. And anything that I'm saying in this video, it's not, hey, 100% we take this to the bank. It's, hey, this is emerging science and I wanna be ahead of the curve, so let's pay attention to it. So when it comes to MCT oil, there was a study published in Helion. It was done in rats, but they took a look at one, three, and six gram dosages of MCT oil for 28 days. One and three gram dosages improved working memory. When you started getting into the higher dosages of six grams, it improved spatial memory, which is like global memory, like overall my memory is good versus working on a task. Now, there's countless bodies of research that I have seen suggesting MCT oil being good for network stability, ketone formation, overall just brain function. So as we get older, probably one of the most quick, potent, immediate things that you could notice for cognitive function and helping stave off that sort of potential cognitive decline. Number two is gonna upset some people, kale. I know Paul Saladino says kale is BS, but I'm talking about it in a cooked form and we're not all doing an animal-based diet. So with kale, it's interesting because there was a study published in Nutrients and this, again, it looked at rodents, but what they did is they induced inflammation via lipopolysaccharides. So they made their gut porous and basically produced gut inflammation. What they found is when they would preamble sort of this whole effect with two weeks of eating kale, there was less overall inflammation producing bacteria. So kale seemed to have a protective effect on the inflammation, which you may or may not understand how important this is, but inflammation as we get older ends up like a runaway train. You have damage associated molecular patterns, you have DNA damage that creates its own inflammatory response as a result of immune system activation. The more we can get inflammation under control, arguably the better our life could be. Number three, blackberries. They are one of the most potent sources of anthocyanins. So when you're looking at supporting the brain with a powerful antioxidant, there you go. Hey, you want another rodent model study? You don't? Well, tough, because here's a good one. This one took a look at rodents that had 2% of their diet, just 2% of their diet coming from blackberries for eight weeks. They found this improved their motor performance and their working memory. Now, we don't have to look at rodent model data when it comes down to straight up anthocyanins. Okay, we just know that blackberries in the rodent model research seem to have a direct effect, but we also know from human model data that anthocyanins in blackberries, blueberries, boysenberries, mulberries, things like that, they have a potent effect. Even eggplant, a potent effect on the brain. This next one is my favorite one. And it's my favorite one because it flies in the face of Netflix documentaries, it flies in the face of so much stuff and propaganda that is out there. It is meat and get a hold of this study. This study was published in the International Journal of General Medicine. It took a look at 175 countries, and it took a look at a huge pool of data from infant life expectancy, five-year life expectancy, overall life expectancy, and you know what they found? They found a ridiculously strong correlation between meat intake and overall life expectancy. You might be thinking like, oh, well, that's just a correlation. Well, it makes it better when you understand that the correlation was also adjusted for calorie intake, adjusted for obesity, adjusted for just overall BMI, and even adjusted for carbohydrate crop. What this tells us is that this is one of the strongest dietary indicators that we have of life expectancy is their meat intake. Now, not their saturated fat intake, not their hydrogenated fat intake, straight up probably lean meats when you look at a lot of these countries but meat seems to be potent, and it's very important as we get older. I have had countless researchers on my channel, and all of them seem to agree that protein is key, whether they're plant-based or not, but the ones that are not plant-based, that don't necessarily have that skew or that lens on, all say, when you're over 50, protein and meat becomes more important. What's interesting is that this study actually found a weak correlation, not a strong correlation, but a weak correlation between carbohydrate intake and poorer life expectancy. Now, 
it's looking at a lot of data. So I'm sure America made up a lot of that. They said, uh-oh, Americans eat a ton of carbs and their life expectancy is not as good as the Okinawans or not as good as Sardinia, right? So it's pretty important that we pay attention to that. Now, a lot of it probably has to do with micronutrients in meat, has to do with the satiety, has to do with the muscle protein synthesis, has to do with the insulin spikes, all those big reasons, right? I also put a link down below if you wanna try ButcherBox. Yes, I know I mentioned meat and then I mentioned ButcherBox, but I think it's kind of an appropriate time too, because yes, they're a sponsor on this channel, they support us doing this, and it makes this all possible, but it's delicious tasting meat, grass-fed, grass-finished beef, ground beef, ground bison, New York steaks, ribeye steaks, scallops, chicken, pork, hot dogs, you name it, all of it down below that link, just beneath this video, please give them a shot. It's gonna save you money because it ends up being cheaper in the grocery store, especially when you factor in gas, but it's some of the best tasting meat that you're going to have. And I stand behind that because I've been using them for seven years now. They've been on this channel as a sponsor for seven years because they provide me with the meat. And candidly, I'll buy a box even if they don't give it to me because I go through the stuff like crazy. So that link is down below just beneath this video. Next up, goji berries. Now there's a study that was published in Planta Medica found, that found that goji berries actually have a liver protective effect and they actually could block some of the renin and angiotensin system, thereby affecting blood pressure. It's pretty interesting. But then when you look at other literature, you see that there are six different polysaccharides in goji berries directly impacting the gut bacteria, impacting inflammation. So yes, there's a lot of sugar in them, so I would only recommend maybe a tablespoon or so, but they are pretty darn potent. Next up is going to be lime. Lime is one of the most bioavailable forms of vitamin C that you can find. Second to that, I'd say maybe yellow kiwis, like huge amounts of vitamin C. And when you look at the scientific literature, well, vitamin C is strongly correlated with blocking oxidized LDL or blocking the oxidation of LDL. So the journal Molecular Sciences had published a paper showing that vitamin C was directly correlated with that. When LDL oxidizes, it was when atherosclerosis forms. That's when you have a problem. So when you can increase your vitamin C intake, that might be something that you wanna pay attention to for your overall heart and cardiovascular health as you get older. Next up is chicory root. I would highly recommend adding chicory root in because it's 70% inulin. And inulin is the type of fiber that you really want to be looking for. Check out this literature. The American Journal of Clinical Nutrition had subjects consume 21 grams of chicory or a placebo with maltodextrin for 12 weeks. Okay, what they found is that the chicory root group lost a kilogram, so lost around three pounds, plus they had decreases in ghrelin, Plus they had decreases in insulin and glucose and nothing else changed. No calories, nothing, they just added the fiber in. Chicory root or inulin is an indigestible form of fructose. So essentially it ferments and it changes the gut microbiome, but it also keeps you satiated. So when you're controlling your weight as you get older, you wanna control fat intake, you wanna control your overall fat accumulation obviously, but you wanna increase your protein intake. So fiber goes up, so you eat less fat and so you absorb less fat. Protein goes up, so you build and maintain more muscle. Next up is pectin. Okay, pectin is a fiber you're gonna find in like apples and cherries. Whole different ball game here because pectin has anti-inflammatory properties. There was another study done on mice where they, again, induced inflammation in these mice via lipopolysaccharides via the gut. When pectin intake increased, it blocked the actual inflammation from the lipopolysaccharides that was formed. It was an inflammation blocker at the gut level. And this very last one is one that I find so fascinating. I'm a big fan of whey protein, but for older people, you may wanna try milk protein isolate. Why? Because there's newer research that suggests it might even be better if you're older. There was a study published in Nutrients that looked at whey protein versus casein protein versus milk protein. Okay, all of them induced muscle protein synthesis. All of them increased free-flowing essential amino acids. They had the positive impact. But in this particular case, they used rats and they had these rats swim for two hours, which sounds horrible. And then they would give them these various proteins. There was about a 7.75, 7.76% increase in muscle protein synthesis with whey and casein, but an 8.3% increase with milk protein. Probably has to do with the available amino acids in milk protein, the complete protein that you get. But as we get older, it becomes more important because we don't just want an acute spike like we might get with whey. What we get with milk protein isolate is potentially a spike in protein or spike in insulin that allows the growth and then a little bit more sustained afterwards. So milk protein isolate might be making a big comeback. Personally, as someone in my 30s, I still utilize whey. I don't see a real reason to go heavy into the milk protein. 
But if it's a quick way for you to get something that has science behind it, I would highly recommend trying it. As always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.